Hi everyone, welcome to our panel discussion with the members of, for, members of the former Loft Group. Uh, very excited to be here today. Uh, we have uh, select members on. I want to start and have them introduce themselves. I'll start with Tan. Great, I'm uh, John Tan. Started uh, at Loft in 1996 and was involved uh, with the full disclosure advisory He's publishing a uh, Novell Netware and uh, actually uh, publishing a cyber UL paper back in 99. Participated in the Senate testimony and uh, the at stake R&D group that uh, that came out of Loft. So now I'm uh, last 10 years or so I've been in the financial industry. Excellent. Joe. Uh, my name is Joe Grand, uh, also known as Kingpin. Uh, let's see. I was the I don't know when I joined with Space Rogue and 90 or something like that. I think I was 15, 16 years old. Um, I was the youngest member of the original kind of group of the loft, and, and it sort of became my haven uh, growing up. Um, I'm a hardware guy by trade. I was involved in the Senate testimony and basically didn't say anything because I was so freaked out. Uh, <laughs> and, and I had to wear a suit, which is not natural. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of hardware hacking still, uh, give trainings. I run my own company just kind of designing electronics and, and teaching people about how to break electronics and I've um, been working on, on growing my beard to look more like space rogues, but I'm having a hard time. Yeah, I hear you. I'm in the same struggle. Uh, yeah. Chris, why Sobel? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Hi. Sure. I, Hi. I, I, I used to go I by Weld Pond, Pond, Pond and uh, I joined yeah, the Loft in 93, um, about the same time uh, Kingpin did. We actually shared a desk. Uh, I was on the software side, so I did some research into um, Windows vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, did some programming. I was one of the uh, authors of Loftcrack, did Netcat for Windows, and uh, you know after after the Loft got sold to At Stake and At Stake got sold to Symantec, I left there and started a company with Dildog, who is one of the other Loft guys who's not here, uh, called Vericode, and that's uh, that's what I'm doing now. And uh, Paul Nash. Hi, I'm Paul Nash. I used to uh, publish research under the handle Silicosis. I joined the loft back in, I think, late 98, early 99. Um, I'm more of a software guy. I published a lot of stuff on network vulnerabilities, focused some stuff on Solaris vulnerabilities, uh, occasional Windows slash Microsoft issues. Went on, uh, once we were in at stake, to do a lot of research around the security of the cellular 3G infrastructure as well as detecting attacks and that, and also some storage area network stuff. Excellent. Mr. Space Rogue? It's interesting that everybody else you introduced with their real name, and then they <laughs> said their handle, and then you, <laughs> me, you introduced with the handle, and I have to tell people my real name. Yes. Uh, well, I don't have to, I guess, but I, I, I do use the real name now also. So I'm Space Rogue, or Chris Thomas. Um, I was joined the loft with Kingpin back a bazillion years ago, <laughs> uh, and while I was at the loft, I did uh, Hacker News Network. I also ran the uh, WACMAC archives. And uh, currently, I'm working at Tenable as a strategist. Excellent. So uh, how did all of you, uh, I guess, you know, individually get involved uh, with the loft group? Like, what was going on in your lives at the time that kind of led you to, uh, to join the loft or create the loft? Well, I think it all started with Brian, who's not here, unfortunately. He invited all of us individually to be members of the law. And he basically knew us all from his bulletin board, uh, Black Crawling Systems. Uh, and so you had to know him on his bulletin board first. Oh, wait, no, you had to meet him in, real, in person first, and then he invited you on the board. And then if you were lucky, you, you got invited to the law. Was, was, like yeah, I mean, was there a test? Or? <laughs> you had to hack the Gibson. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't say there's a test. It, you sort of had to be able to contribute something. Like, uh, you know, he looked at me and said, oh, he can program. He looks like he can do system administration. You know, everyone sort of, uh, he looked at us and said, do you have some skills to do hacking? Can you contribute to this new sort of hacker space that we're, we're building? So he kind of pulled different people based on what they could, they could do. Yeah, you sort of have to remember that back, you know, back in the day in the early 90s, the hacker community was a lot smaller. There wasn't a formal security industry like we were a bunch of guys on or kids on bulletin board systems you know all kind of boston area hackers so uh it, it, we had some get togethers once in a while but we pretty much knew each other from the bulletin board systems and when the loft had started you know formally with with brian oblivion and count zero kind of moving all of their electronics junk from their apartment to this loft space that's how it sort of formed 
Um, for for me personally, how we how we we got involved uh, or formally in, involved anyway, like I'd known a lot of these guys since I was like thirteen or fourteen years old. Um, I was doing a lot of stuff that I probably shouldn't have been doing at the time, mischievous mm-hmm. things, both it, 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 with computers and without. Uh, so they sort of kept me at arm's length for a while. At least brought you know Brian did and Count Zero. Uh, I eventually got in trouble for some things, and after that, they're like, "All right." He's done with, you know, doing dumb things. Let's, you know, bring him in the loft. And that to me really saved, it saved me, you know, it kept me out of trouble. It gave me a place to go. And I got, you know, basically mentored by mm-hmm. all these other guys. Uh, most, of, most of us knew each other in person already <laughs> anyway, because we were doing, at the time, there was something called the Works Gatherings in Harvard Square, mm. which is, and the Works was a bulletin board, like an underground hack freak bulletin board uh, in Boston, 617 area code. And we would have these gatherings at, at Aubon Pan in Harvard Square, uh, and those kind of morphed into 2600 meetings because this was way before well, 2600 meetings existed. Mm-hmm. And so we all kind of knew each other from those meetings. So Brian sort of picked us out, if you will, and invited us to, to join the law. So, well, there was also the, eight, there was also the ATDT meeting, right? You guys remember um, oh, yeah, the, ATDT the original before, Grillathon. Right? Oh, and Grillathon, yeah. And that was, so was 1991 or something. There was a lot of in person meetings. It was. It was really a sort of a social group, which was sort of cool. So were the, the goals early on, were they more like personal? Did you create it and join to, to better yourselves and, and have a place to do hacking? Or uh, even early on, did you have goals to like make the world a better place or, or what have you? Yeah, I, I would say it was really just to learn about the technology and have a space to do it in. We could share hardware because we had a physical space. We could share all the manuals because nothing was online back then. Someone wanted to learn about you know, VMS you know, it was great to have a set of manuals to be able to do that. Uh, and yeah. if you wanted to learn about networking, you had to have a bunch of computers to network together. I remember the, the first time we actually got our network up and going, we were using Landman technology. It wasn't even Ethernet. And we got it all set up because we wanted to play Network Doom. This is back in like 93 or something. Mm. And that was like a motivation to learn about networking so we could, you know, get Network Doom going. Yeah, I think the goal, the sort of formalized goals of, uh, you know, trying to change the world with s- discovering security vulnerabilities and educating people and all that came way later. Like it really was just a clubhouse that we could go to and, and work on stuff. And it was that, it was an awesome, awesome thing. That goal kind of grew organically. I don't think we just sat down at a meeting one day and said, OK, here's our new security yeah. focus that we're going through. It just sort of happened. Right. Because we were all deploying technology at our jobs. We were all had technology jobs at the time. And so we, the security aspect of it just kind of grew naturally out of what we were doing anyway. Yeah, for me, I think a lot of it um, goes back to the BBN days because a, a large portion of us worked at BBN and we found a number of vulnerabilities with the technologies we were deploying and publishing them under the loft was, was very convenient. Yeah, because you couldn't really publish them under BBNN, could you? Right. Was that one of the, the goals for all of you was to have a place to publish vulnerabilities or did, was that something also that grew kind of organic? That was way later. I mean, that was, mm. you can almost think of the loft in, in two separate phases. You had like the original loft in the South End, which was like a totally kind of, it, it was a neighborhood you didn't want to go into. We had our, our, our uh, a local crack fiend that we called Jack the Crack Fiend that would sit outside on the loading dock and like store his crack pipes underneath a little cover on the loading dock. And like, you know, that was a much different, phase of the loft. Um, but as that, like, like Spaceworks said, as that organically grew, I think that was like five years later, we moved into a new location in Watertown that was more of an, like a light industrial office space. And that's when things got a little more organized. And, uh, you know, we, we all started to realize that we could maybe do this as a full-time, you know, thing and quit our jobs uh, at that point. But it really was these two separate phases of like the original loft as like pure hacker uh, hangout spot and people would crash on the couch and all this stuff to then more of like a formalized, almost like a hacker space you'd think of today, but still more private. Was there a lot of other people who gravitated towards the, the loft to come and hang out? Was it a social oh, yeah. gathering place? That was actually one of the problems that we had early on, as Joe said in the fir- Kingpin said in the first phase, right? We would, it was kind of a hacker flop house. People would come yeah. by and spend the night on our couch, which we didn't really like. And, and it, that was kind of one of the reasons why we decided we had to move further out of the city. Uh, so that we you had to at least take the bus to get there. Um, and, but the other, that's the other thing, too. I mean, it's a good point, because if you look at the people that were, were kind of surrounding 
the loft or who were in 617 at the time, and then you look at the people who are in the information security industry now, there's so many people that crossed over that we interacted with back then that interacted with us. Uh, and I think it's not just loft. It was like all of 617 just kind of grew up and been, oh, we're security now. Uh, there's so many people in the industry now that were around back then that were in that small little community. Was there uh, an economic model to pay rent early on? And if so, what was it? So I handled uh, most of the bills, but uh, yeah, everybody paid a share of the rent. Uh, and then the goal was to try to raise enough money so that we wouldn't have to pay the rent out of our pocket. Mm -hmm. So pretty, yeah, early, we, pretty early on, it sounded like there was a business aspect to it. No, nah, I think I, I think like the first few years we were all paying rent. My parents were actually paying mine, which was awesome because I was in school and didn't have a job. And uh, and yeah, Weld and I shared a desk, so it was half of the normal price anyway. So it was a great deal. Um, but yeah, I don't think that even came in into into our minds until we moved to the new spot. And we're like, all right, how can we how can we offset our costs? Like, let's make T-shirts. Let's do the Whack Mac archive, right? Let's do black crawling systems. Turn that that BBS into an actual CD. Uh, you know, try to give to the community in ways that would help support us at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there was the time. And, and there was actually a decision. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say there was actually a, yeah. a, a decision point where we were we were wrestling whether we would be nonprofit or, you know, uh, some sort of for-profit corporation. So um, it, it definitely wasn't, you know, all out business, but obviously you do have to pay the expenses. Having them come out of your pocket isn't all that fun. Right. At some point, right around the move time, between the time we moved from South Boston to Watertown, we actually incorporated it as an LLC. Mm -hmm. so we were an official business entity, uh, mostly just because uh, we were taking in income and we sort of had to do something with that income, like officially. Mm -hmm. So we incorporated it as an LLC, but that sort of, sort of pr furthered us along the road of actually you know, trying to pay for itself. How much of that income came from dumpster diving and refurbishing computers? A lot. A lot. <laughs> really? The MIT, a lot. The MIT flea market was our like annual so gathering to, you know, monthly. we would just, uh, a monthly, yeah. I mean, we would gather stuff out of dumpsters and this was for real. Like you'd read articles about us or like news reports and it's like, we actually went and rode our bikes around and collected stuff out of dumpsters or drove the cars. Of the fleet. That's, the thing, that's the thing that got me. Like we would go, we'd load up a truck, we'd rent a U-Haul, <laughs> load it up with equipment that we all got from our day jobs. Drive to the or MIT the trash. Fleet yeah. at 6 a.m. And we'd hang out at 6 a.m. until 9 a.m. until they opened the gate. And in the meantime, everybody's riding their bikes around MIT looking through the dumpsters for more stuff that we can sell at the flea that day. Yeah. Yeah. It worked. And that, that was a huge thing. That's actually how we met um, Lady Ada. You remember that? Oh, and yeah. Window, I, and Window. And Window. Up there, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's funny. Yeah, that was definitely a hacker. And still, was, and still is to this day. They still have that uh, MIT flea market, right? I went back there. I went back there just visiting um, last year, and it's like a lot of the same old timers are still there, and they're just as grumpy, mm. the same old crap. But it's an awesome, awesome spot, and like that would be our ritual. And after we'd sell stuff, we'd go to like the, I don't know. The, remember that like uh, restaurant in Harvard Square? We'd go to and hang out. Oh, with play with 13. our yeah, play with our yeah, new stuff. Uh, and then, the pizza place with the with the Street Fighter video game. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. <laughs> Oh, that's that's really cool. Um, so, what was it like discovering and disclosing vulnerabilities? Uh, you know, kind of early on, and how does that differ from today? Yeah, I, I think the disclosing the vulnerabilities was what sort of pulled us in the path of like, you know, we can we can help out people and publicize that you know there's a lot of security issues with you know personally and for businesses because we would disclose a vulnerability in something like Windows and the press would like swoop down on us. We'd get be getting phone calls be getting interviews would even be getting on tv because of some of this stuff and that started to to make us think well if, if disclosing vulnerabilities is getting this much press it must have a big impact on society and i think that really pulled us in the direction of hey we should figure out how to do this the right way and we should figure out how to educate people so that was a, a critical part of the loft becoming more of that consumer advocacy group that ended up you know going to the senate Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had all been sharing information with each other and information with other hackers throughout our careers, if you will, or whatever. But, um, yeah, like sharing those publicly. And I think we were at a point where we were not really afraid of what would happen or there, we didn't even think about that. Right. That wasn't even a concern. It was just getting information out to the public. 
And when the media grabbed onto it, it was like, great, we can we can try to try to be the front face of like this, you know, vulnerability disclosure sort of thing. But now the front face and we all, you know, we talk about your hacker handles. Was it important back then? Did you how much comfort did you take in having, you know, the hacker handle or persona uh, back then? The handle was very important because of the fact that we were releasing uh, vulnerability information. The, the rush to litigate by companies was much worse than it is today. Right? Mm -hmm. Today, if somebody tries to litigate you for reporting something, it makes the press and, and everybody pays attention to it. Back then, if you got sued because you tried to release something, that was it. You were pretty much on your own. So the part of the reason... Well, we, 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 we all... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Was that Tan? I was just... Yeah, I, I was just going to say that the uh, uh, they, they wouldn't just uh, try to go after you legally. They'd also go to your employer. We had someone that came in and was uh, working with us a little bit on the uh, the loft crack stuff before it was ready to go, and uh, wrote an article and bite about it under his real name. And you know, they, he got all sorts of pressure. It's not just directly legally, but uh, um, you know, they came down on his employer, threatening mm -hmm. to, all sorts of stuff on them if they didn't handle him. So. Uh, using the the pseudonyms was pretty uh, pretty essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we weren't even. It's not like we were just pissing off the vendors. Like we were just pissing off other people in the security community at that point. A lot of the academics didn't understand why we were releasing information, why we weren't just writing white papers and going to academic conferences. Like we were coming from a totally different angle and sort of intruding on this you know nice formal, well defined family of academic security researchers releasing stuff. And like, I, I remember some emails, people are, you know, why are they handing, hiding behind handles, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know, that was an important part. And we had done it all through our life anyway. So it was just a kind of normal thing to do. I mean, we well, still know so, each other by their handles. Like it's still right. tasty, it's still well pawned, it's still silly. You know, it, it tan, is still tan. And, and part of that is, I mean, we, we thought it was so important. That's why we went, when we testified to Congress, we continued to use the handles. And it wasn't until at stake when after we had got the VC money and people realized, well, nobody's going to hire Weld Pond, right? So mm -hmm. that was kind of why we started using the real names uh, at that time. Well, some of us got outed uh, without yeah. our permission anyway, right. <laughs> even at that point. And some of us held on to our handles much, much longer. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the other thing, don't forget, I mean, we, so I worked at, uh, when I was at BBN with, uh, with Mudge and then eventually with uh, Weisopel, we ran security there. So we were doing security for BBN and we were discovering all these vulnerabilities in these products and the vendors were just ignoring us. And so we got zero traction giving them the information until it was published by this this magical third party called The Loft, then all of a sudden a patch would be derived and it would be mm. fixed. I mean, we spent a lot of the stuff trying to actually fix and secure the location or basically secure the uh, systems at our day job. And it was weird too, because then you had the whole hacker um, community and they didn't like it because all of a sudden you're publishing stuff that maybe other people found, maybe they didn't. It's the whole, hey, you just, you blew a zero day. It's like, well, why are you doing that? Why don't you just hoard onto it? Because there's this whole movement of people that just wanted to collect and hoard the zero days. It still to use is. Them. Yeah, yeah, and there still is, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, now there's actually a market for it. Back then it was just more for status. It's like, well, I have the latest RPC exploit in uh, Solaris or what have you. Mm -hmm. And it was just for bragging yeah, rights. No, right, there, and there was no money to be made back then. Like we weren't doing it no. for money. There were no bug bounties. Nope. This was a sort of a new, oh, a man. new Imagine way of doing things. If there was things. a bug bounty back then, we'd be stinking rich right now. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't have to go to the MIT flea market anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when did some of the other members start joining, uh, like Mudge and some of the other members that, that couldn't be here? Uh, Mudge so, came later. Mudge came later. Uh, yeah, Mudge came when we were in, in the Watertown. Just about when we moved to Watertown, Mudge yeah. came. And then uh, I would say Dildog and Silicosis came a little after we were in Watertown for like a year or so. Yeah, we, we had some, we had a few other members. I mean, you know, Brian Oblivion or um, Count Zero was heavily involved. He was one of the founders. GoGo13. We had some other guys from the White Boston. Knight. White Knight. Was White Knight. Um, for, from the, like the original phase of the loft that they, they, left for various reasons and some of it were personal issues that some of us had that was you know it was sort of a kind of a dark time in, in the loft and, and a transitional time because they had been so instrumental in setting up the loft and then we just sort of took it uh you know count zero left and he was a huge mentor of mine and then mudge came on and then we decided to go to watertown and then it that was the next step mm -hmm. uh but there were definitely some you know instrumental people in in the loft back then uh and um yeah so it, they came so much came on and then 
I think like two or three years later, Silly and, and Dill came on. We had tried some other people as well, but you know, this was much different than like a hacker space where you see today of like welcoming everybody and right. come in and, and work on stuff. Like we were very private uh, because we were hackers and that you know we were doing controversial things. Mm -hmm. I remember um, building the firewall on the night that uh, you guys had the talk with Stefan. I was just I was sitting in the other room. <laughs> I just heard the conversation, and man, it was uncomfortable. And then magically, yeah. lo and behold, uh, a desk opened up shortly thereafter. <laughs> Personal so you had skills. To, you, had to ask, you had to ask people to leave. Is that a couple of times? Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. And then we also had some trial periods with people to make it a little less of like you're you're in and nope you're out. You know, it's like. <laughs> But we were learning as we went. Like I don't think any of us had any sort of personal skills of how to deal with that we stuff. Had, like we were we making had, it we up. Had the, the excellent hacker skills of social interaction that all hackers have. I see. Yeah. I see. And your friend, you know, you're spending a lot of time with these guys all the time, and 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 you're it, it, on person on a personal level, and then also doing technical stuff, and like you know, it's not easy. Uh, but I think we got really lucky, and to be able to have a group of seven of us, or how what did it end up being eight? Um, it, it was special that we could actually all work together for so long and and do what we did and not have all sorts of drama. You know, it's like that doesn't happen very often. Was there a, a moral ethical code that you guys developed for the for the group? No hacking from the law. <laughs> <laughs> we did actually have so, we did have some incidents. You're breaking up. You're breaking up, guys. Blah, 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 blah. You're breaking up. Is he talking about some instances of hacking from the loft? Uh, I know. Have yeah, I was no going to mention. I was going to mention a certain guy who hacked NASA from the loft and kind of caused us some pain. Mm -hmm. Oh right, because we had we would sell. One of the ways we made money was we would sell shell accounts on our box. Oh like, okay. Oh yeah. Really you couldn't yeah. get onto the internet really easily. So we had a, our Solaris box, and we would sell, you know, five dollars a month shell accounts or whatever it was we charged. Um, and we had a couple of instances where people were using those accounts to do bad things. Yep. The shell accounts; those were the days. Well, um, we had people hosting information too that was questionable. That we had to, you know, get lawyers involved to sort of defend ourselves about we're just we're just hosting content. Like that's not. Oh, yeah, our we content. had. A, I remember there was a case with Motorola. We were hosting somebody's website. Uh, who had a lot of cell phone information, and uh, Motorola didn't like the fact that their trademark was being used, and so there were some legal issues around that. Right. Yeah. What was your relationship with some of the other um, hacker groups at the time, like Cult of the Dead Cow and Ninja Strike Force? I think there's a huge overlap. Yeah. I think that um, I know Mudge is part of CDC, Dill CDC. Um, I'm White part Knight. of the Ninja Strike Force. Was. White Knight. That's right. And I think there's that. And there's also the crossover with the other hacker households as well. I mean, there was a uh, new hack city uh, where I lived for a while with uh, Veggie, Death Veggie from CDC. I didn't know you uh, were back. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I lived at New Hack. Yeah, because it was also Messiah AG, Village, Messiah uh, Village. Yeah, Sin exactly. House, uh, yep. three or four other ones. Around. Oh, yeah. There was a lot yeah. of that hacker commune stuff going on in Boston at right. the time. Mm -hmm. That'd be like the late, later 90s is yeah. when that stuff started up, right? Mid to late 90s. No, no, I think it was earlier. I think I would say definitely mid, mid 90s. I mean, Messiah well, Village. Messiah was, Village was 94, I think. 94, 95. What, that's what right. was Messiah Remember, Village? Was that in the Boston area? Yeah. It was over in, uh, what, Roxbury? I uh, know, Jamaica Plains, JP. Bad neighborhood either way. Yep. So now, at some point, uh, how did it come about that you were uh, called upon to testify at Congress or lobby to testify at Congress? Like, how did that all play out? I think it was an article in the Improper Bostonian that started it. It has a domino effect. Yeah, so we got an article in the Improper Bostonian. It was a multi-page spread, and it was basically a weekly magazine, newspaper magazine in Boston. And a reporter from the Washington Post saw the article, and he called us up and wanted to do an article in the Post. So they did the article in the Post, and then one of the staffers for Senator Thompson read the article and got in contact with us, uh, and that started the ball rolling to get us to testify. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it was an external uh, entity almost that, that drew you to... Yeah, um, they came to us, yeah. And, but then you had the idea to rent a van and drive down there. What, 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 what was <laughs> that? You got, you got to talk about the drive down there because I've heard a lot about the drive down there. Epic. It was awesome. <laughs> Except when Stefan was driving because he, he was a horrible driver. <laughs> <laughs> so you all pile in the van. Like, What was your strategy to go testify before Congress? So it was a bunch of hackers in a van. I heard you made a, a pit stop at the NSA yeah. uh, when you were driving down there. But like, what was the strategy? 
uh, drive to DC, testify, drive home. <laughs> yeah, I think we're hackers. I think a lot we didn't of, have a strategy. <laughs> I think it was sort of this, like to me, it felt like you know a band going on tour, right? Where everyone rolls into the van, and like I'd always wanted to do that, so that was just an awesome experience to do a road trip with these guys. Um, Mudge was really the one that tried to put some order around it, because yeah, none of us, you know, we had we had some radios in the car, and we were like writing some code and. We had a big antenna on the on the top of this van, and we were just you know hacking around and talking and stuff. But but Mudge um, really did put the effort together to like, all right, let's get some written testimony that makes sense. You know, I'll speak first, and then and then Weld and and Space Rogue and then me or whatever. Like you know, put put it in order. And I remember the night before, like we had practiced. We all sat in in, in a room and practiced what we were going to say. Uh, at least for our opening statements before they, the senator started asking questions. So that we didn't really have a plan other than Mudge sort of helping us get it all together. And uh, in general, I'd say it turned out all right. So was the comment about being able to take down the internet in 30 minutes, was that rehearsed or did no, that no. just get blurred? That was just blurted out, right? Mudge, Mudge, that no, just happened. It wasn't, it wasn't blurted out. It was planned, but it was only planned by Mudge. I don't think he told anybody else. I didn't know anyway. Did anybody did else you think know? It, did you think that was planned? Uh, he, I yeah. Did, I didn't. When he said that, I was just like this. Oh my god! <laughs> and all the and all the camera flashes started turning on. Like every all, you know, the reporters were taking notes, and as soon as that happened, they like jumped up, pictures taken. I was like, oh my god, this is horrible. Because I'm a hardware guy anyway, so it's like, how am I going to explain that to people? Yeah, but, but the thing is, though, it was true because it was totally I mean, true. It was. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we so uh, we were working at BBN doing the whole internet backbone for NSFNet and a bunch of the other. Um, early internet service providers and uh, DARPA networks. And it's just like, as we learn about the, the protocols that were used to route traffic across the internet, it just, the vulnerabilities were so glaringly obvious, yet it just, uh, it wasn't well known. And so I think that uh, it's just some of the stuff that uh, we just saw in our day-to-day -day jobs and it's. Yeah, it, it, and is that, that's still the case, right? Like some of those vulnerabilities have still not been fixed. Uh, you know, yes and no. I, I think that uh, BGP still has issues, but I think that uh, a lot of people are secure, doing a more secure deployment of BB, BGP and actually using the authentication functionality, and they have tighter uh, routing announcements. That I think don't that one, one of the interesting things about that whole 30 minutes thing was the fact that afterwards, people would come up to us and say, hey, were you talking about you know, XYZ as how to take down the internet? And we were like, uh, no, but that'll work too. Because there were so many issues, and there still are, but there right. were so many other issues other than just the one that we found uh, that it really was and still is a very fragile ecosystem. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. So was it after the, the testimony that you had decided that uh, you wanted to become more formal um, and make it your day jobs. Was that the goal of, of you know, coming under the at stake uh, banner? I think, no, I think the original thought was we just wanted to pay for itself. And then at some point we said, well, we want it to pay for itself and pay our salary. We want it to be our day job. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I don't know if the testimony was involved with that decision or not. I don't think so. But in the, in the process of getting it to pay our salary, we had to get VC. And when we went to look for VC, all right, go ahead, Paul. No, no, it's not true. I mean, we had paint gigs. We did the consulting, right? Yeah, so sure. I did the mm -hmm. NFR stuff. So right. I was allowed to leave BBN to focus on the research that I was doing at BBN, but full time instead of essentially at night and on weekends. So that allowed me to focus like summer of 99 on the stuff. And that NFR gig, I mean, that brought in a lot of cash. That was a big dough. Yeah. yeah the, the, and and we did some pen, the, we did some pen testing. That was our way to try to pay for our salaries, right? We're right. trying to do it on our own. I think we realized... Well, we'll get. It's going to take us forever to do it on our own. Right. Uh, and we have all this other stuff that we really want to do now, and the only way to do that is with venture capital. So, uh, uh, Weld Pond, you were saying. Uh, oh yeah. So, so there were some of the other things we were doing is we were actually doing pen testing too. We did pen testing of. Oh, what was it called? Cambridge Consulting Company? I forget what that was. Cambridge, Cambridge Technology. Technology. Oh, Cambridge Technology. <laughs> How do you forget and, CTP, man? Yeah. So it was really funny because they af they actually were thinking about, you know, buying the loft at the time. This was like another option, right? It was like, well, you could get funding or you could have a company buy you like Cambridge Technology Partners. Um, and we did, a, we did a pen test to show them what we were capable of. And we ended up taking over their whole infrastructure and kind of embarrassing their whole security team at the, at the time. Well, remember, there, there was also the, I was in charge of, of voicemail hacking, which was the only <laughs> thing I could do with networks. And um, ended up, we, we had hacked the voicemail of one of the guys, right, who was in charge of the negotiation. 
and we basically heard him talking to, leaving a voicemail for another guy, like, I don't know about some of these loft guys, you know, Joe and Brian doing hardware, like, I don't know, but if they come along with the package, like, fine, let's take them too. And um, we, I remember doing the report when, when we came with, like, that giant report, you know, everyone sitting in the meeting, and you guys went over, like, how we just owned everything, and their faces were just like, oh, man. So that didn't end well. Was there uh, how much revenue and focus did the loft crack product uh, get when you created that? Yeah, that that was actually a pretty big revenue stream. We ended up getting uh, Dill Dog to work full time, so he was working full time by like '99, getting paid with the the loft crack salary, uh, getting paid with the loft crack revenue. So it could basically support sort of one person's salary so it was, it was pretty significant I, well it's, it's, i think it's important to remember though with loft crack we gave it away i mean you could get it for free if you didn't want the windows version right the, the command line version was free for anybody mm-hmm. to use and that was our gift to the community like we gave away the command line version yeah, if really you had right. to have a gui and you couldn't use the <laughs> command line then you had to pay, you pay it up. was cheap I, I think we were we were charging like 100 bucks a copy or something yeah it was itself. relatively inexpensive and i remember i remember it was a big issue because i was handing the, the bills at the time a lot of companies wanted to pay on a PO on credit terms. And well, I'm like, no, uh, just cut us a check. Like, <laughs> figure out how to get a check out of your organization because we're not doing POs and credit. But yeah, I think, Paul, to answer your earlier question, though, the Senate mm-hmm. testimony, like, like Spacework said, it sort of happened in between. Like, we had already tried, we wanted to try to bootstrap ourselves at that point. Um, the Senate testimony happened and, and, you know, maybe justified a little bit more what we were trying to do uh, and gave us maybe a little more clout like when we went to talk to Cambridge Technology right. Partners and, and deal with VCs. But I think we originally wanted to try to bootstrap it, which is why we were doing the consulting and then, we, you know, we, why we were selling CDs and selling hardware kits and stuff. Um, but then really when it was going to be all of us quitting our jobs and, and uh, wanting to, you know, make at least it enough to live, then we had to go down that other path. What was the relationship like with Microsoft, given that you had the loft crack product and had disclosed vulnerabilities? Uh, none. Yeah, I would say, yeah, they, they, they didn't really like us, but they were also intrigued by what we were doing. Uh, there was a meeting with Mudge and Hobbit. Hobbit was one of the local Boston hackers that kind of was sort of on the edges of the law. And they had done a lot of research around Microsoft's networking protocols and authentication protocols. And they wanted to, Microsoft wanted to learn from us. They wanted to learn, well, how do you do this? How do you reverse engineer this stuff? How do you find these defects? This was back in like 98 before Microsoft knew how to do this themselves. So there was a little bit of, they were intrigued, they wanted to learn from us, but they also also weren't happy that we were basically telling all their corporate customers and their government customers that mm-hmm. the stuff is insecure. They didn't like that part. Yeah, I mean, do you look at what Microsoft's doing today and kind of like have an I told you so attitude? Well, no, I think that uh, it's, I think we were a huge factor in the security program that they have today. I, I think that we helped shape the vulnerability disclosure process at Microsoft, and I think mm-hmm. the later work at at stake to help incorporate uh, security uh, or software security into their security and software design lifecycle. It was huge. I, mean, I think for at stake, Microsoft was a huge, huge customer. Yeah. So at stake was instrumental in in helping Microsoft at, at that time, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so what what was Ask it like? Dan Gear about that. <laughs> so uh, what was it like when uh, you first began to uh, become at stake? So did you kind of feel like you were losing kind of that loft edge when you were part of at stake, or like what was the general feeling when that happened? Well, you know, it was it was pretty crazy. We went from I spent like summer of '99 in this warehouse space with zero air conditioning, no ventilation whatsoever. With like you had an air conditioner, one. Did yeah. he? We I gave you one. Like, <laughs> right, sweat, just like, I mean, I lost so much weight that summer just because of the, the sweat pouring off of me. It was nuts. And so we had all of us there, or a, a large number of us there. And then next thing you know, we're in this corporate environment with uh, this pit with HR directly across from us. And like Dan Gear sitting in a flipped over garbage can at, at the end of my desk. It was, uh, there were some uh, rocky moments, especially I, I like the-, the day that they demanded uh, the suits. I think, yeah, I think the honeymoon period um, was short-lived, but it was really, at first, it seemed like we were doing the right thing. Like, it felt, mm-hmm. it felt good. Uh, you know, Mudge had worked out this deal. We all got involved, and, and it, it felt good for a little about while. As we're, yeah, about six fired. months. And then, right, and then we had to, you know, they, they said we had to wear suits for some stupid reason one right. day. And, like, Glad and I Space Store got, got fired, that. and, like, that ended up being a whole, God, that could be a whole other podcast in itself. 
Yeah. At, at, at what point did you start asking, where's Mudge? And there's been a lot written about that. So <laughs> the floor is That yours. came later. That came a lot later. The first mm-hmm. thing that I, 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 I personally want to put on record is that was like, you know, that was later on. I think the original downfall really was Space Rogue getting moved to the marketing department because he was running yeah. HNN and none of us did anything about it, right? We're like, well, we're the rest of us are still in the R&D lab. Like, we're doing what we want. Uh, you know, people were calling us, you know, prima donnas from the loft and stuff, the, all the consultants outside of that area. But I don't think any of us really cared um, when really we should have been like, well, what the fuck is going on? Like, we're the loft. We came in as eight guys. We're going to leave as eight guys. And, and that didn't happen. And once the company realized that, I feel like that was the beginning of this kind of slippery slope of, of, of you know, the rest of, of that kind of the way we split up. So everyone's going to have their own opinions. But I think that was the first thing. Mudge became a sort of was the manager of us for a while. And he didn't he didn't sort of disappear until later on. Right. I mean, that was like a it was 2001, 2002. Yeah. So it was like a year or so later um, after that. But it was it was not good. The whole situation was not good. No, it wasn't. I, I remember the very first day I stepped into the office, uh, the guy who was the interim CEO said, here's a $7,000 laptop, here's a th- or $7,000 laptop, $1,000 Herman Miller Aeron chair, and yeah. a, a Palm Pilot. Just take it. And I, the quote was uh, something like, the VCs just say we're not spending money fast enough. And mm-hmm. it was just insane. It was just, I, I don't think that some of the initial management really knew what to do with the funding that they had and this the group the loft that they had acquired i think that there was this marketing arm and they just didn't understand the potential around hacker news network and there there was this yeah, big they issue too didn't understand that. No, they didn't. And I mean, I think all of the media, all of the popularity, all of the press came from HNN. I mean, the contacts that you had alone from HNN was amazing. And they completely blew it. They did not know what to do with that. I had like a 30 page business plan written out just for HNN at that time. Because I mean, at the time, it was just a website. And I I remember I had forecasted a a revenue goal five years out of, okay, HNN, if we do all these things and everything's perfect, we're going to make this much money. And they're like, that's chump change. We want millions. And I'm like, what the fuck, man? You know, yeah. at that point, then, like, I didn't care, like, whatever. And then, like, a week later, they fired me anyway, so it didn't matter. But now, Space, uh, H&N, a lot of people recognize it from the video podcast, but when you're talking about it, it was a, a editorial website. website, correct? Yep. Yeah, it was, I was trying to model it after the Slashdot model, which, if you remember at the time, was mm. the website, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was hoping, or trying to do a, a hacker version uh, that covered a lot of the same, or, or variety of news, uh, and added some, some, you know, the hacker side to the stories. Uh, and so it, it was a really popular website at the time. I mean, if, if you look at some of the videos that, the, that were coming out of the government at the time, the, the massively produced videos, and you look in the backgrounds, everybody, all these cyber, well, they didn't use cyber back then, but all these cyber people in the government have H&N on their screens in the background. And I, and I just always thought that was very neat. That, that, and I, I, I was found out years later that uh, it was actually H&N was the basis for the NSA briefings inside the NSA. Like they would read H&N and the guy would write the briefing and then give that briefing basically off of H&N. Uh, uh, you know, I believe it because, I mean, you were up at like, what, four o'clock in the morning oh, scraping all yeah. of the news Freaking sites day. every Do morning. So like by six, it was published and it was amazing. You can go there every morning and get a nice summary of all of the security related happenings over the, like the past 24 hours. Yeah, so, yeah Space Rogue so was, was doing the news. Yeah, right. it was doing the news. Got to do the news. Uh, <laughs> So not to deviate off the loft too much. I mean, it was 10 years later after at stake and Tan calls me up and says, dude, we got to do H&N again. I'm like, what now? He's like, yeah, we'll do it in video. I'm like, I don't know nothing about no video. He's like, yeah, neither do I. So I'm like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> so Tan, yeah, you know, Tan, what, I, was, what was the motivation to bring back H&N? Uh, I guess... Uh, uh, actually, I, I really missed H&N. That, that was something I, I went to every day, and it was uh, a shame to see it go away. And uh, I guess just after a while of being out of at stake, I was just itching to, to start something up, and the uh, uh, video podcasts were starting to become a little more uh, popular than, you know, they were, they were fairly obscure prior to, uh, in the maybe two years prior, the, barely any out there. So, uh yeah, uh, we were hoping, you know, it would take off, and I guess we uh, ran out of runway. But uh, well, I think the problem, Tan, was that neither one of us were really salespeople. 
And so trying to yes, sell ads, it, it was just like we couldn't sell, we couldn't get anybody to, to pay the big bucks to make it pay for itself. So we're trying to do a full-time job plus H&M. It just, it, it, after, what was it, two and a half years, we just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, and trying to scale that up was a little bit difficult because uh, one of the, some of the product ideas included like uh, a takeoff on tool time or a takeoff on home improvement that was, you know, just somebody, computer security, Tim, the tool man, Taylor, that would do all the wrong things and because he was looking for power or speed or whatever. But, uh, you know, casting casting for a sitcom is, is a lot more difficult than, you know, having just a standard news anchor and uh, so much so much more involved to actually grow that into something that we could do full time. And it's, it took up the whole weekend every week, so it was rough. Okay. So what, at what point did the loft start to not be the loft anymore? Like after the at stake acquisition, like. Yeah, pretty everyone, much that day. Pretty much that day. I think, well, yeah, I mean, I think the day the space rug left, I mean, or was fired, that was, a, I mean, that was the first huge fracture. Um, mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it got worse because I think at that time there was a bunch of people, all of our friends in the industry and in the community, all of a sudden they were turning against us as well. I remember Gweeds with the whole sellout articles and all of that stuff where there was this huge backlash that it's like we were selling out, which really wasn't the case. I think we took some of the money so that we could continue the research, which in the end just kind of never really happened. But I think a and lot of it, too, like we did. Yeah, I mean, people, we were the first sort of hackers to to start a legitimate company outside of the LOD guys, you know, 10 right. years earlier or something. And so it was hackers sell out and people assumed we were running the company and we took all this, the $10 million for ourselves, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't like we had started a, a real company and we were just one piece of that company. And yeah, when Spacer got fired was sort of the, the downside and like, you know, a lot of us sort of split up and, and didn't see each other on a day to day basis anymore, or, you know. I think Weld moved to a different office uh, outside of the lab. But even right. with all of the bad stuff, like there was still some good things that came out of it. Like we were still working to push security and to educate people about security and continue to do research and give talks and write papers and advisories while balancing like serving the VCs, right? And serving the CEO and the rest of the company. It was just, you know, extremely frustrating, but a really good learning experience for you know moving forward from there yeah. now I, other, I, I, other than space rogue we we know about his unfortunate departure but when did uh the rest of you start to move on from from at stake i, I think brian. so brian so yeah so brian ended up i actually ended up fi having to fire brian because Ooh. when much much left i took over as the manager and the ceo at the time you know basically we had some bad quarters in a row right so this is remember this is like 2002 the economy is not doing so well um and there was going at stake had layoffs and the ceo was of the mindset every department has to be touched there's no there's, there's no ivory tower no one it has to be everywhere so i had to make the hard decision to lay off brian because um he, he had the less capab least capability to make short-term money for the company, basically. That was part of the, part of the um, decision criteria. And we were all getting pulled to make money short-term. Like, I was getting pulled to do consulting all the time, mm -hmm. you know, flying out to Microsoft and doing that. And I know, uh, you know, Diltog had, had to do that, too. So it really kind of changed the whole research long-term investment uh, mentality that we sort of went in with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think a lot of us were planning to be to wanted to ever be consultants, um, and that was something when right. when Brian got fired. What, uh, the way I heard it is that there was not you know enough. He was doing a lot of wireless stuff, and he had set up GorillaNet back in the loft and doing you know Wi-Fi, which was sort of this up and coming technology. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I think that the wording from from some you know manager higher higher up. Uh, you know, way above Weld was like, well, wireless isn't getting the traction that we need or something like that, which is, you know, funny looking back at it. But at the time, that was the justification. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think I personally didn't want to be a consultant. And when Brian left, he was, you know, again, I've, having grown up with with these guys and, and especially Brian as that mentor and he was gone and he sat right next to me. It was like, all right, this is, you know, this is not right. And I think I left like a few months later, 2002 or 2003. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it was crazy. We had the lab space and all of a sudden, one by one, people started leaving. Yeah. It was just awful. Um, you know, another thing, too, that another moment that killed me was the whole issue of uh, vulnerability disclosure, where we started off at law doing vulnerability disclosure. And then all of a sudden, Aztec said, you know what, 
we can't publish vulnerabilities because it's going to hurt the bottom line. Mm. What? But at first, when we awesome. first joined with them, they said we could, right? They're right, like, damn right. straight, we hire hackers. We're going to do this. We're vendor neutral and everything we wanted to hear. But then when it actually came down to it and the VCs you know, were really running the show, that's what they're like, nope, not doing it. Yeah, exactly. Well, part and of it was we wanted to have like Microsoft as a customer. You right. know, we started off with like the banks as customers, um, enterprises, and then we started to have software companies as customers. And then you're starting to get into this conflict as a company that that really was a struggle. Well, that's what you know. That's sort of a typical conflict these days, right? Is like we came in from from a point of not caring if we piss anybody off and and not making money to now. People have, you know, security companies are very careful about what they release. A lot of their releases are purely to to get that, you know, extra media coverage to get that next client, right? It's just a much yeah, different way of, of vulnerability research than what we were doing. Like, it's a totally different world. Mm. Uh, along those lines of being a different world, if you were to testify in front of Congress today, what would you say different? Uh, nothing. I'll just you? show them the tape from 10 years ago, 15 <laughs> years ago, how long it was. And maybe say more and not wear such an expensive suit. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I think not a lot has changed, right? I mean, I think we talked about this. I don't remember if, if we talked about about this together on our you know separate conversations, but th- not a lot really has changed. It's probably gotten worse, right? Because there's way more exposure and way more people involved and way more technology and like the Internet of Things is going to be this whole other disaster. Well, just, yeah, a so lot I think, of people look at like the Internet of Things and cloud and all these other new technologies and think security has changed. It hasn't. Like the right. basic fundamental things of security are mm. still the same stuff, right? Same Hack problems. systems, look at your users, where they are, log everything, et cetera, et cetera. These are basic fundamental things of security, and none of that has changed since before us. Like we didn't invent yeah. that. Loft didn't come along and say, oh, here's security. I mean, security right. existed before then. It's going to exist in the future. And even though the technology changes, the fundamental aspects of security don't. Right. Yeah. I th- with the exponential growth of the internet, I think nowadays people are looking towards the internet of things and the cloud. Oh, the, the cloud's going to make me secure. Whereas, it, you know, I'm just not seeing it when I go out and I do evaluations of third party vendors and stuff like that. I, I'm just seeing so many vulnerabilities and flaws. And it's just, it, it, I don't know. It's, it's a bad, it's a bad, change. it's bad. It's good job yeah, security, it you know, but it it's is, also, right. it's, it's frustrating to see having, you know, we've been waving our arms and jumping up and down about security for a long time. And just to see more and more money come into it and more and more companies, but not really a lot of progress. Like there are little things like on the vulnerability disclosure side and the bug bounties. Like I think that's that's definitely gotten a lot better. Yeah, but in general, it's like for every company that's doing it right, you have 10 new companies that are doing it wrong. Mm. Well, and the thing is, it's the industry spun up too. So now that there's billions of dollars in government research, you have all of these startup com- or not startups, but all of these co- companies now that offer all of these uh, security tools and services and stuff like that. And you know, some companies actually get it, and they're kind of they're built by really really smart people. Other people, you can tell that they're just going after the money. Are there things that you would have wished you could have said ten years ago that you think might have made a difference, or things you could have done, uh, you know, ten or fifteen years ago? We could to have the Senate, or to people, yeah, to the Senate specifically. We could have somehow made people listen to us. Like that would have been nice. Mm-hmm. I don't know how we would have done that. Yeah, though, but the message. Would I have feel been like fun. I feel like the only thing that really came out of that Senate testimony was that yes, we can take down the internet in thirty minutes, and not the rest of the testimony where we talked about all sorts of other interesting things mm-hmm. and weaknesses in, in, in security. You know, it's like the the media took that soundbite, and that's what the world learned about. Yeah. Uh, but there was a lot more that that I, we said plenty, or the other guys said plenty. That um, you know, could have been taken to heart and could have actually, you know, done done some good, but it just wasn't. Mm. Um. So, uh, how has you know you came out of at stake and you all did different things after that? Um. But how has being part of the loft, like, how has that shaped you, uh, in this industry? Huge. It yeah, was, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, it's yeah. a good door opener. It definitely works to open doors. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you introduce yourself as State Rogue and you say you're from the loft, and you're like, oh, you know, I mean, and, and that, that has definitely helped career wise. Mm-hmm. Uh... Especially at At Stake, there's such a huge community of people out there now, whether they're CISOs or running uh, boutiques or, you know, uh, the top consultant at some other company. Uh, it's just a huge community of people who went through that organization and, and they, they all know each other. 
other that we all consider ourselves alum of at stake. So um, it, it, it's just a, being able to know like half the industry on a, on an almost personal basis is, you know, uh, an advantage you certainly can't look at uh, gift horse. You don't want to look at the mouth. I mean, I think at stake yeah. at its height was what four or 500 people, something like that. And I think yeah. all of those, every single one of those almost to a person has gone on to become a big name in the industry. Hmm, and right. Like you can't spit at RSA without hitting somebody from our, from that <laughs> stake. I mean, you really, you can't. Uh, and the fact that all those people, we all knew each other, we all worked together, has really done a lot, not only for us personally, but also for the industry as a whole. Mm-hmm. Or, but yeah, be, but being, part of the, being part of the loft, though, is like that, you know, I mean, none of us knew what we were doing, right? And it's, it, it turned out to be a great thing. And, and again, it's like to, to be there at 16 to 22 years old with, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of mentors. And, and at that point, like, you know, there were not a lot of other people hacking on stuff and it was just a, an awesome, awesome place. I, you know, I don't know if it like, yeah, like space Rogue said, people are like, Oh cool. You're in the loft. Like, I don't know if that, if that adds any professional clout or whatever, but like it's, it was an awesome experience to be involved in. It's just, it's, it's cool to see that people actually still know about it and sort of know the history of it or even care to know about the history of it. I don't think 15 years ago or 17 years ago, how many years ago it was when we were actually there doing the thing with, we thought like, Oh, 20 years from now, everybody's going to know who we are. Like, yeah, <laughs> that, that was not, not in our, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think one of the things the loft gives you though, is it gives you this perspective because we were there at a time when the computer security industry was basically just antivirus companies and a firewall company. And we have perspective of how the, uh, the techniques that hackers used of like, breaking into the software, hacking it, um, reverse engineering it, and the whole idea of doing penetration testing on software uh, and hardware, uh, was that was a formative time for all that. It gives you perspective. It always wasn't that way. It was really the hacker community brought that to the way of doing security today, and we were there at that time. So it's, it's very satisfying to know that we helped bring that along, and I think a lot of people recognize that. Yeah, I think with that stake too, that sort of, and, and w- well, this is probably true for you, but it, it taught me a lot about how businesses are run and how, you know, VC backed companies are and how executives can control a company and how it can change the feel of a company. And I took mm-hmm. that to, to go off and, you know, start my own thing, knowing how to run a company or how not to run a company really to run it, you know, run it differently. Um, and I'm assuming that some of you, you were able to take some good pieces out of that too for Veracode. Yeah, certainly. It was a learning experience on like how not to do some things. And I think yeah. Dildog and myself brought that to, to Veracode. And here we are. Veracode's lasted 10 years and uh, <laughs> at stake only lasted five. So we're doing something <laughs> right. Wow. Are there things that you like look back on and you're like, wow, I got away with that back then, like doing some of that stuff that you look at today and you're like, wow, I, I think we'd all be, be in jail if we tried to do it today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that really, is sure. that really true? I was wondering how true that really yeah. was. Oh yeah. We'd all be labeled terrorists. <laughs> I'm terrified for my nephew. <laughs> I'm terrified for my kids. It's something, yeah, I mean, we were doing things, you know, the, it, the, the laws were different. The industry was different. The government was different. Our world was different. Um, the logging. The logging was different. Everything. I mean, <laughs> disk space was so expensive. If it wasn't yeah. for billing, it wasn't being recorded. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's just a different time. And yeah, I'm terrified for my kids and for you know uh, the whole new generation of, of hackers that are getting involved in things and joining hacker spaces and going to hacker conferences. It's like you have to be so careful, right? And you can't sort of push buttons anymore and just see what happens. And you can't just piss people off to see what happens. You're going to be mm-hmm. labeled and you'll be thrown in jail. And well, it's the a scary, scary too. time. There's also the whole organized crime aspect of it, and I think that's uh, that's definitely changed. I mean, if you look at all of the ransomware, crypto walls, crypto locker, and stuff like that, I mean, you can see that people are trying to really use malware as a means to generate revenue, and I think it's like becoming very sophisticated, and it's just... It's not like it was in the past where it was just a lot of people in academic environments or just people kind of thinking differently about systems and technology, but ultimately wanting to do the right thing. I think now you have sort of this criminal malicious element that's moved in that's just really trying to uh, profit off of it. Along those lines, what advice uh, do you all have for those getting involved with uh, computer security and hacking in our industry today? Learn from history. Yeah, absolutely. Learn from history. 
don't do what, I, what we did I back think, then. Yeah, well, I think it's <laughs> learning from history and, and, and set up an environment like we did at the loft. We, you know, even though things were different, we still set up our own networks to hack on and we still brought things into the lab. And I think that still needs to be done. Um, but get a good lawyer if you're going to go, you know, public with anything. Well, I think, well, that's, I mean, a lot of people nowadays are like looking at websites and banging on websites to try to find vulnerabilities and they're not really, they're not, the, the websites don't want you to bang on them because they will come after you legally. So if you want to do that, you need to set up your, as, as Tinkin said, set up your own environment, get more than one machine, uh, you know, hook, make up your own network and bang on stuff yourself. And then once you find, and you've done all the research on your own equipment that you own, that you can legally do whatever you want with, well, then you can write it up in a document and, and do something with it. You know, so with, it yeah, really, with really virtualization it. technology and the low cost of embedded systems, what do you think the loft would look like today if you were to build it today? Too clean. <laughs> It'd be just one computer, right? Yeah. <laughs> It'd still be out of the garbage. That's right. <laughs> so. I think it would be a totally I – don't, I don't even think you could compare. I mean, if you look at hackerspaces today that have you know, amazing resources and equipment – um, you know, you can get logic analyzers and, and embedded systems and computers and all this test equipment for basically nothing um, or very low cost. And there's all these open source options. I, I don't think you can compare. Like it's, most you know, of, it's Most of your hacker oranges. spaces today, though, aren't really what I would consult a hacker space that like no. loft. They're maker spaces. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with maker spaces. Yeah. They're great. Yeah. I go to them it, all the time. But they're not really what loft was doing, like security research hacker mm. space. Well, I think that's also because of the, the risk of, of what hackers are, are are facing, but yeah, it's a different, it's a totally different environment. Um, I don't know if I would want to have a loft today, you know, like I've been invited to create other hacker spaces and it's like, I've done it and I've done it with the guys that, that I wanted to do it with. And like, I don't have that. It, it's a different feeling now. Um, so I don't know if I, I wouldn't want another one. Even yeah, if we had better one, equipment. Of the, one of the hard parts is getting the right group of people together that can all get along and actually work on projects together. That was, that was really kind of, uh, magical, and I think it's really hard to do that to, to, to meet people who think the same way. And it being being part of a team is so much more powerful than just working on something by yourself. To be able to tap into other resources, and that was a big lesson learned. But it's something that's not easy to recreate. Yeah, the ability to look at a problem and or just bounce ideas off of each other. I mean, I think of so many of the discussions mm -hmm. that I had with Dill or Mudge um, back in time, where it was just. It was always nice to get another person's angle on it. And I think that we would always continue to push and challenge each other. And it's just, it's hard to find that environment now. So uh, I would just, I want to go around in, in, as we close out this interview, uh, if there are research projects or if people want to learn more about, hey, you know, what are the loft, some of the loft members doing today? Um, so I'll, I'll start with Tan. Oh, I'm uh, living a undercover life in the financial industry, so <laughs> not much I can say. About no, no that. worries. That's cool, Joe. Um, so I am on Twitter once in a while at Joe Grand. Um, I have a website, Grand Idea Studio, which I basically show off all the stuff I'm working on. I still do a lot of kind of open source hardware design and and teach classes about hardware hacking. So I'm around. I give talks. I'm always available to email. Here's like you know I work on crazy. There's a JTagulator device to let people more easily get involved in hardware hacking and still sort of doing, I would say, like what, what I did at the loft of like working on projects and trying to educate people um, and, you know, trying to scrape by a living without having to, to, to mm -hmm. sell out again. And Weldpond? Yeah, so um, I'm also on Twitter at Weldpond. And um, most of my time is sucked up by being the CTO of Veracode. Mm -hmm. um, I have to travel a lot, go to a lot of conferences, talk to a lot of customers. I was actually at the Pentagon today. Um, but uh, outside of that, I still try to you know, dip my toes into you know, hacker things. Um, side project is Loftcrack. A lot of people don't realize that Loftcrack is still out there, uh, me and uh, Dildog and Mudge are still working on it. We're hoping to come out with a version 7. So that's a that's a fun side project we're, we're, we're doing. Nice. Paul? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm still doing a lot of security research uh, at my day job. Uh, I'm just trying to make where I work a, a better environment and just trying to help foster the security mindset. You know, I've, uh, I'm a father of three boys and I'm watching them grow and I'm watching them look at the way they approach problems and try to define problems and sort of look for solutions and alternative solutions. And I just try to encourage that. Mm. 
that's that's a lot of fun. I have two boys myself. It's fun to see them get involved with the the hacker side of things too. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Watching them rip things apart, just yeah. kind of test things. It's yeah. it's awesome. Daddy's going to DEF CON. What do you want? A lockpick set. Okay, you got it. You <laughs> yeah, got exactly. it. And Space Rogue, of course, we're we're fellow coworkers at at Tenable, but yeah, we don't work as closely as we probably should, which is unfortunate. I know. But, I uh, know. Yeah, so I'm I'm doing the strategy thing at Tenable. Um, basically, I'm doing occasional talks here and there. Some vendor talks, uh, mostly not, which is good. Uh, and then I'm also helping out with the public policy stuff, uh, talking to some lawmakers on the Hill about changing the laws and, and dealing with the, I think the Commerce Department just had their vulnerability disclosure meeting last week. Um, trying to change things from the inside, uh, making the world a better place is still the primary goal. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you all very much for your, your time today. It was wonderful having you on the show. Uh, I will most likely call upon uh, probably all of you to come back maybe individually and, uh, and dig deeper into various topics. So, again, thank you very much. Cool. Thank Thanks. you. See you guys. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.